are you? Are you good? How good is this church? What a great church. And if I lived in Manchester, I would definitely come to this church. It's fantastic. And I uh, just love being here today. What a great city Manchester is. It's just a fantastic city. I can't get over how alive and crazy you guys are. It's like a part, everywhere I'm going, it's a party city. The weather might be happening today, a bit of wind, but no, we're partying, we're having a great time. Just a great city to be in, great place. And uh, Clint and Sophie, you guys are just awesome. Honestly, you're just awesome. I've known you both for 20 years, and you're just champions, you're just conquerors. And uh, you know, what I love about you is you just, you know, you just have committed to the journey, committed to the task at hand that God gave you, and you both just humbly got on with it. And I love you, you're humble, you're passionate, yet you're very wise, very smart. I'm just glad to be in your world and uh, glad to have paid a very, very small part. Thank you, you're very gracious to me. It was very small. But to be here and see what God's doing in Manchester is just a huge, huge blessing to my heart. I think you should give it up here, pastors. Come on. Come on, Glenn and Sophie, let's give it up. Now just turn around and tell somebody, I love your haircut, that is really beginning to suit you. <laughs> Come on, do it with some passion. All right. Actually, can you stay on your feet? Can you stay on your feet? Stay on your feet with me, we're gonna pray together. Where's Matt? Matt, I'm here on my Irish passport, you naughty man. Over here telling Irish jokes. I'm on my Irish passport, that's how I got in the country, so be nice to the Irish. And you were, you were. All right, just lift your heart to the Lord, everybody. Can you stretch out a hand to God? I'm just going to pray that the Lord's going to speak to you tonight. And believe that God's going to say something to everybody. Believe that tonight someone's going to get a miracle. It's called the miracle of salvation. And, uh, and I believe that somebody's going to step out of a very ordinary life tonight. Your life right now is very ordinary. But I really believe somebody's going to step out of that kind of neutral place and get into first gear, second gear. You're gonna get into fifth gear of a brand new life in the uh, months and years ahead. That is gonna actually be surprising to you and everyone around you, I really believe that. Father, I just pray, Lord, for everybody here tonight. Just pray, Father, Jesus, that you'll be with us. We need you. Holy Spirit, you're here in the house. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Father, I just pray that you will speak to every heart, every life, Father. Say something beyond what I say, God individually, Father, to people that will help them right now to go forward, to step up, to continue in the journey, to start the journey, to get out of that neutral place. You ever stuck right now, Lord, in that cul-de-sac? I just declare they're coming out of the cul-de-sac. They're getting on the freeway. Come on, they're getting out of the cul-de-sac and they're getting on the freeway, Father. And I thank you, Father, that you're bringing people higher. Lord, they're coming to a new place. And Lord, I thank you for this, Lord, the anointing for salvation in your house. Let people be saved, Jesus, tonight because of your goodness, your grace. And Father, we give you all the praise and all the honour in Jesus' mighty name. Can we just give the Lord a great shout of praise, everybody? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And everybody said... Amen. You can be seated. God bless you. Thank the team up here as well, leading us so uh, powerfully. Thank them as well. Wow. Well, it's, I feel like I'm with family tonight. So many friends here I've known for a lot of years, and just so great to be here with you. Dave and Ann Adams. I've known you since Adam was a boy. And Linda, great to see you. Robin Rach. So many here. Uh, Mark and Emily, I first met them when they were about three. So great to see, a little bit older. But just great to be here with you. You know, uh, when I come to speak somewhere, I always try and ask the Lord, Lord, what is the message you want me to say, not what I want to say? When you're a pastor, you can get, your, you can get messages you like and you want to speak that message, but that can be very different to what the Lord is saying to you to speak on. And so I'm often saying, Lord, show me what you want me to say, not what I want to say. And uh, you, you know, you hope you get it right. You don't always get it right, but you, you look to God. And so tonight, as I 
was coming there, I felt the Lord had today, this morning, put on my heart this message. And then tonight you sang the words of uh, what I'm about to speak about in that last, the first worship song about going up the mountain. And uh, I really, as that began to play, I was like, thank you, Lord. He always gives me a little confirmation just before I get up that I'm on the right track. So can I just say to you that I believe the message for this church, and this is for this service, but the message for your life, that I feel the Lord's put on my heart to encourage you with, not to say thus is, this is the word of God, but to say to you, I feel like the Lord wants to encourage you with this, is that it's time to climb. It's time to climb. Time to climb. You know, years ago when I, uh, you know, I was growing up in a poor area in Sydney. My dad was an alcoholic. That's in Australia. My dad was an alcoholic. We were Irish uh, family. My dad was Irish. My grandparents were Irish from uh, County Clare. Came out to Australia many years ago. And, uh, but when they came, my grandfather had a lot of grief from a lot of things from Ireland, a lot of pain, a lot of stuff in his life. And he just brought it to Australia with him. And it was very interesting. When he came to uh, Sydney, he uh, moved near the beach. He was really quite close, but went to the beach twice, then put huge drapes up in his house and closed the drapes and lived inside and never went to the beach again and basically lived in regret that he left Ireland. And uh, my childhood was being with, it, with this very unhappy grandfather who'd regretted the past. All his pain came through to my dad, who became an alcoholic, and we ended up with a lot of poverty, lots of problems, lots of, so many issues. And uh, I can remember as a teenager thinking to myself that your life, if you come from a family with problems, you have alcoholism, you're poor, you have problems. This is, I honestly thought this, that if that's the case, your life can never change. I thought your life can never change. It, this is it. This is what the families had, that generation, that generation, that generation, poor problems, you know, negative. I just thought your life can never change. And when I heard the gospel for the first time, I was so shocked. All my friends were getting into drugs and getting into stuff and, you know, and I, mean, I was so shocked to hear in church that God had a plan for your life yeah. and your life could be different. I, I, honestly, it was absolutely shocking to me. Everybody else is running up, and I'm like, is this, is this for real? Like, is this serious? You know, when I heard Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, to do you good. I, I was like, what? Well, that means that your life could change because God has a plan, and there's actually hope for you. And it, it was just shocking to me. I had no, and I thought, I have no concept up until this point that anyone's life could change in any way. And now I was hearing the gospel and I was hearing what the Bible had to say and I was realizing that the God we serve has come to intervene into our lives today in 2015. And can I just say to you, the word of God contains history and the things written in there, many of them are historical facts, but the purpose of the word of God is not to be a history book. It's, its purpose is not to be a history book, as I said, contains history, but it's to speak spiritual truth and life to you and I in Manchester in 2015 that we might move into the place that God has called us to and begin to live a life that God has designed that fits you. And I really feel that this church is a church, Glenn, I just feel faith in this place. You and Sophie have a gift of faith. You're anointed with faith. And uh, I believe there's faith in this house. And I believe that God's going to use your church to be a great inspiration to many other places, many other churches, both in uh, this nation and beyond. But I really believe that what God does say to us and what he said to me, even as a 19-year-old, is you need to change your perspective. You keep looking here when you need to look here. And God was trying to get me to begin to look up and come to a new place and come to a new height and come to a new level of living, but there was going to have to be some change in my thinking, and I was going to have to get into, listen to this, agreement with God. 
Many of us like the idea of God's plan in our life, but we're actually not in agreement with it. And I had to begin to agree with the fact that God had a plan. He wanted to lift my eyes up and he wanted me to come up higher. So for someone here tonight, I want to tell you, God wants says to you, it's time to climb. You know, uh, in the Bible, mountains, I found this out, are mentioned 500 times in the Bible. Not five, 500. Moses received the Ten Commandments on the mountaintop. God revealed himself on the mountaintop. Jesus appeared to the twelve on the mountaintop. He gave the sermon on the mount. The Great Commission was given on the mountain uh, near the Sea of Galilee. The Transfiguration, where Jesus, Elijah, and uh, Moses appeared together, was on a mountain. The Bible talks about Mount Carmel, talks about the Mount of Olives, talks about Mount Ararat, talks about Mount Sinai, talks about Mount Zion. The Bible has a lot to say about mountains and coming to the mountain place because it was the place often where, i.e., Moses met God. And I want to encourage you that God's saying tonight, He wants you to come up higher because in His presence, He's going to strengthen you. God wants you to come up higher. Because in his presence, he wants to strengthen you for the great purpose and the great plan that he has for your life. I don't know about you, but I love mountains. I love mountains in the natural. Anybody love mountains? <clears throat> get up there, you get perspective. You see, you know, the vista, the distance, the perspective. It just changes everything, the fresh air. And, uh, and you know, every year I'll make sure that I go. And I, years ago I took up skiing. And I live in Perth, Western Australia, where if we have any snow, it would be on the highest point for one minute every year. So <laughs> uh, we have no snow. So I got to leave our state and go and ski every year. And I love it because, once again, it's refreshing. It's great exercise. But I really believe there's something spiritual about getting up in the height and getting a new perspective. And every time I do it, what's true in the natural is true in the spiritual. There's something about what's true to the, for the natural is true in the spiritual. I get up there, I may have arrived with problems, I may arrive with challenges, but when I get up higher, <laughs> it's amazing how, how after three days of that, with a different perspective, a different view, suddenly I'm seeing life differently. Some of you, God wants you to start to see life differently. He wants you to get a new view. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 18 in the New King James says this, and we heard... This voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. We heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. You know, over the years, and I've been saved now, as I said this morning, 34 years, I've watched people in the kingdom of God come. Some of them go and do amazing things. One 17 year old I took to the church, to church with me, his name's Steve Kelly. He uh, went on to lead a church now in the United States with nearly seven or 8,000 people in it. And I watched this little broken down alcoholic boy get saved and then begin to come up high with Jesus. And both of us have been friends now for decades and decades. But you know what? Some people come to church and they're awesome. They're loved by God. They have an amazing call. They have amazing destiny. They don't even realize the moment. And I want to just say to you right now in your life, this is a divine moment. Right now, this is a divine moment. If you engage your heart, not just your mind, but your heart with the fact that this is a divine moment, and not just because I'm speaking, I'm talking about in your life. If you will see that and realize God is trying to speak to you and you engage with it, then your life will begin to change in ways you've never dreamt of. But what we're going to do is we've got to get out of the planes of the social club. <laughs> And what I mean by that is I love fellowship in the house of God. I love fellowship with God's people. Love it. In fellowship time, I'm there. Let's, let's connect. Let's party. But you know what? Some people never, ever understood that you need to climb and begin to meet Jesus in a higher place. They started to make it all about the social time. And when the social time can only take you so far, when it runs out, suddenly you start to, you start to like, hang on. You know, the party's kind of over. Stayed in the plains of the church. And I want to tell you that what you've got to do is you've got to climb, come back down, climb, come back down, 
fellowship with the people, but then you got to move away from the people just like Jesus did, the example of him come up higher to be with the Lord so that your walk and your life is built on revelation and relationship with God. If you stay in the planes of the socialization of the church, I think in a couple of years' time we'll lose you. Because if you're not growing, you're going. If you're not growing, you're going. And it doesn't matter how spiritually you are now, you've got to keep growing. So that means I've got to keep coming to where Jesus is, keep reaching out to meet him. We need to be careful in the day we live because in the day we live, we're Facebook till we drop. What we need to do is drop Facebook for a little while. Drop it off. Somebody needs to drop a little bit of Minecraft. Time to let that go for a while. Call of Duty, special ops. Time to move away from that. Come away from the planes of Call of Duty Special Ops and say, Jesus, I need to get with you. We, someone even needs to get away from reruns of The Bachelor. Ooh, move away. Do you guys have that here? Oh. Okay, sorry I mentioned that, ladies. Don't even go there. In Australia, it's a big deal for all the girls. But we've got to say, hang on, I got there's times for that, there's times for this, there's times for fun, there's times for the computer. But you know what? These things need to not be the control of our life. Because there is a prize to be had as you come up higher with Jesus Christ. There's something to be had in your spirit, in your heart, in your life that you can get no other way than that you got with God and God ministered to you in a powerful way. Mick Jagger could get no satisfaction. But Jesus wants you to be deeply satisfied in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit, because you are walking in a place with him where you're like, wow, this is in a new level. This is a new level of understanding, a new level of knowledge, something that God begins to put into your heart. You begin to hear the voice of God like never before. I want to tell you, God wants to speak to you. Some of us right now, the things you're facing, one word from God can change everything. Some of the things you're facing right now, one word from God, one, one word from God, one word, it's changed, one word. So the enemy wants us to stay in the plains where God has come higher. I, uh, I was really just trying to get after God afresh, you know, and, and uh, I worked, walked into our church on a Friday night, and as I walked into our church on a Friday night, we get, we're like you guys, got a lot of young people, young people coming through our choir and as I'm in the praise, we're praising away. I look into the choir, the praise. And as I look at the praise at this girl in the choir, God goes, that's your daughter-in-law. As I looked into the choir, never seen this girl before. I haven't noticed her before. She might have been there. I haven't noticed her. And my, we're praising away like we were down here tonight. And I said to my wife, Suze, babe, <laughs> look into the choir. And uh, my wife goes, what for? <laughs> and I said, babe, God just spoke to me. She goes, be quiet. I'm trying to praise God. She's like, you know, praising God. Like we were, I said, babe, I'm telling you, God just spoke to me the same way he said, go and plant the London church, go and plant our Perth church. He just said to me, the girl in the choir is our daughter-in-law. My wife goes, oh, get away from me. <laughs> Don't you love that, wives? That's so supportive. That's awesome. <laughs> Rather than saying, yes, I know the Lord speaks to you all the time, you know. She's like, what are you talking about? I said, babe, I'm not joking. Look in the choir now. This girl, God just told me that's our daughter-in-law. So my wife goes like this. She goes, oh, where? So she looks up, I said, Two down and two in. The girl, two down, two in. My wife goes, all oh, right. And she goes, oh, I think it is our daughter-in-law. I went, I told you, look at her. She's, there's something about it. My wife goes, there is. Okay, where's this Friday night? Everybody's praising, laughing, dancing. And I'm like, <laughs> like this, honestly, still staring at this girl. And my wife's like, my wife's like stop staring at the poor girl. And then I'm just like, this is, anyway, so what happened is our son, who's 17, he had to leave high school. I don't know, I don't know the girl, I don't know anything. Our son goes, right, to, um, to end school, and you have your end of year, what do you call it, prom, form, or whatever you have, and he said, I'm going to take a girl, he said, uh, and Sue goes, oh, is it from school? He said, oh, no, it's another girl. So my wife goes, oh, nice. So anyway, so she says, bring her over, I'll get a flower for her, and, you know, we'll meet her, take a few photos. So we've completely forgotten about that girl, and we also, as I said, a lot of girls and youth go through the choir. So anyway, we go to open the front door, because we know he's arriving with a girl. I open the front door, and here is that girl. This is two months later for the high school prom, standing there, and she goes, hello. And I went, 
I went, hi, Sue. <laughs> Sue, <laughs> and Nathan's standing behind her, and I, like, you know, Perth, we're not really close to many other cities, as you know if you've been there, and I went, uh, are you from Perth? <laughs> and my son's behind her and goes, Dad. I went, uh, yeah, uh, do you live nearby? <laughs> like, I'm just, and my wife goes, Sue, and Sue goes, hello. <laughs> we're both, like, you know, just staying there traumatized, and she's, she's looking at Nathan, my son, and he's looking at me, and he's going, Dad. And I'm like, you look so lovely, um, I have no words. <laughs> like, it was, and Sue goes, yes, I agree. Like, it was just like, and my son's behind going like this to me. And I'm like, have a lovely night, both of you, won't you? And Nathan goes, we'll try, Dad. Like, <laughs> anyway, soon I go, bye. We shut the door and we went, oh my gosh, Nathan's marrying her. Guess what? Last year he married her. I couldn't tell him. We didn't tell him to his wedding reception. Never met the girl. Two months later, I opened the door. God's already told me that's the one. She's marrying one of your sons. And I was like, oh, it's Nathan she's marrying. God will speak to you. Why did God tell me early? That's the son. That son has always been really close to me. A little boy would always follow me around, be with me. And, uh, and God was preparing me because he was going to get married at 2021 while he'd just gone into university. And uh, he wanted to get married early. And he said to his mother, there is no way dad will let me get married. No way. And Sue said, I think your dad will be okay. Go and talk to him. So he came and said, dad, I want to get married to Kerry. And I said, it's all good, mate. Go ahead. She's awesome. And uh, she's absolutely fantastic. But God had prepared me. But you know what? If I was always in the plains, always down here, never got up higher with God, would never have heard that. And, you know, on their wedding day, I was able to tell that story, and she just cried and cried. As I said, we knew long before you dated, two months before, you were going to marry one of our sons. We just didn't know it was Nathan. But God had prepared us. You are the God-given daughter to our family, our first daughter-in-law. God showed us you. <laughs> Isaiah 55 verse 9 says this, For the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Did you get this? For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. If you want to get God's ways, you got to get his thoughts. <laughs> you got to get God's ways in your life. You got to get his thoughts. You got to get up on the highway. You got to come up higher if you're going to begin to live at a higher level of life. And if you're going to move out of that old place. As I said years ago, I took up, um, I took up, uh, a skiing, snow skiing, and started to have a few lessons. And I remember uh, having an instructor, and I had to follow him. And uh, it was completely foggy. And I would have been absolutely in a dangerous place where I injured myself. And he said, just make sure you keep your eyes on me all the time and follow me, and I'll keep my voice as loud as I can, and you'll be safe on the mountain through the fog. Listen, when you get up high with Jesus, all you need is his voice. And it doesn't matter what terrain you're in, in your family, where you live, in the job, in the business. If you just follow his voice, even when you can't see, you're like, Lord, I can't see where I'm going. I can't see what's going on. God will lead you and he'll lead you into green pastures. Come on, he'll lead you into blessed place. But we've got to follow his voice. Psalm 1 verse 1 says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Do you know what? When the Bible says that, it's not saying, you know, uh, just, oh, well, ungodly people out in the world. You can have people in church who give ungodly counsel because not everybody's walking according to God's word. They can be in church, you know, praising, but they're really not walking and living according to that. So we're going to say, hang on, Lord, help me to be attuned to your voice. Help me to be following you, God, through the fog that I'm in right now. You know, uh, on my 40th birthday, I had a vision to ski from Whistler in Vancouver, Canada, from the top to the bottom. And it just so happened that Pastor Jack Haynes from Australia, he was also on the way to Canada, so we hooked up. And he said to me, it would be such a privilege for me to be able to ski from the top to the bottom with you on your 40th birthday. I just had that vision to do that. Anyway, and uh, as I was going down the mountain after Jack, he, he's an incredible skier, incredible. So as I skied down after him, he's saying to me the whole time, come on, chase me. Come on, chase me. Come on, chase me. And once again, all these things that are happening on this mountaintop, experience I've had, I just know the Lord has like been 
you know, provoking me and speaking truth to me by saying to me, come on, chase me. Chase after me. Get after me. Now, I'm not talking about works, everybody. I don't think I'm talking about works. I'm talking about where you set your heart and your focus. Jesus, I'm after you. I'm after your voice. I'm after your plan. I'm after what you have for my life. So Jackson, like, come on, Jared, chase me. You know what the problem is for many of us? We're like, come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus, chase me. Jesus, chase me now. I'm going here, Jesus, chase me. And the only problem with that is Jesus says, no, 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 you come follow me. You come follow me. We want Jesus to follow us, and then we wonder why we end up in problems. Here's what happens. The higher you go with Jesus, the more you begin to see this is the God you can trust. Many people are fearful. They're fearful. They're afraid, so they're trying to get Jesus to follow them. The amount of people who say to me, Pastor Jared, here's my plan. Here's my plan. They give me their 10-point plan. I'm like, good luck with that. Good luck with that. Because if God's not in that, that's going to be hard work. That's going to be painful. You're going to be tired. You're going to be stressed. But if you're chasing Jesus, I want to tell you, he is leading you into the purpose and plan for your life. He's leading you. He might take you that way. He might take you that way. But he is leading you into the purpose and plan that he has for your life in Jesus' name. Don't try and get Jesus to chase you. You need to start to chase him. You know, I've discovered too that when you go to the mountaintop, some people want you to come down. Jesus went up onto the cross and they want him to come down off the cross. If you're the son of God, come down. Sometimes when we're going higher, people are trying to get us to come down. I want to encourage you, don't let them keep going. You know, when I go skiing, when I get up that mountain too, sometimes it's costly. I got to pay for my outfit. I got to pay for different things that that I, I got to do to go up and have that perspective. There's a cost to go higher. And every year I have to save money to pay for the trip, to pay for the skis, to pay for the tickets, to pay for the outfit, to pay for this, to pay for that. But you know what? It's all worth it because of the cost. I say the cost is all worth it because of the payback. There's a great payback. Some of us, <laughs> we, get, we, get, we balk at the cost. Jesus said, if you lose your life, and here, let me put in the Aussie paraphrase. If you lose your small little life that just controls you, Jesus says you'll find a large life, spacious life, open life, full of opportunity and excitement and, and things that you never expected but will just be such a blessing. So I want to encourage you, don't get caught up with the cost. <laughs> get caught up with, oh, you know, I had to pay a cost. Any cost I've ever paid, I can tell you now, whatever it costs, it's so little in comparison to the payback that Jesus has brought to my life and to my family. If you lose your life, you'll find it. You know, sometimes too we get caught up if we think, you know, well, I do that, but you know, I just, just not happy at the moment. So because I'm not happy, I can't do that. I couldn't get after God. Who ever said to you that following Jesus, you'd be happy all the time? Who ever said to you in your life, you'd be happy all the time? I saw somebody at church come in for counseling in their marriage the other day, and they said to one of my pastors, I'm just not happy anymore. Who ever said that you would be? You'll never be happy all the time. Some of you have had three happy meals, and you're still not happy. We need to realize that's not part of the deal is that we'll always be happy. But if you are following Jesus and you are going higher, you will live in a place of significance and fulfillment that you can get no other way. You cannot get it any other way than it comes by that relationship with Jesus and going and living at a higher life. Come up higher. I was having some lessons on a mountain once too and... Talking, you know, lessons from the mountaintop. I uh, actually had a British ski instructor, and I was in a mountain in Austria. Went up the top of the mountain with uh, three other skiers, and we were all having a, you know, a, you know, brush up on our skiing. And this guy said, "What I want you to do at the top of this mountain in Austria is ski down, and I'll correct your technique." So we said, "Okay." So we just were cruising down. So I was cruising down the mountain, yeah, just having, and he's just having a look at us. British instructors down the bottom of this thing. And next minute, as I'm coming down the mountain, honestly, it was like a truck or train hit me at high speed, and I was like, boom, into the snow. 
I, I was just couldn't believe it. I was just like, what has happened? And I was nearly out, out cold. I wasn't out, but I was nearly out cold. And I hear people screaming and carrying on, and there was all this stuff going on. And it turned out that a professional uh, Austrian ski team had decided to slip through us. They thought they'd risk and just slip through us and get, keep going straight across the mountain. But the guy has misjudged it. He was an older guy. And he had hit me, and he was unconscious in the snow. And uh, they were screaming, and the next minute they were trying to, they were slapping him. He was, he was out. And uh, they had to get a full resus van up there, and they had an ambulance come up. I had to get um, ambulance off the mountain. I was okay. And, uh, but they were like, they literally saying to this guy, you know, he's dead. Da, da, da. I was so worried. <laughs> I'm thinking, I hope he's dead. If not, I'm going to kill him. Anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's very Christian of me, wasn't it? And uh, but anyway, they got him back, and he was revived and everything. But it's very interesting that uh, it became suddenly on the mountain a racial issue. And they were like, the other ski team were like, where are you from? Are you from this country? Why are you on this mountain? Now, this is a ski field. Anybody can go there. We're up the top. And they're like, why on the mountain? So suddenly in their distress, they were suddenly saying this, why are you here? Why are you up here? And later on, I thought about it. I thought, isn't that just like the enemy too? Every time you begin to go higher and take new territory, there's a voice. Who do you think you are? Why are you here? Who said you could be here? The British instructor that I had, he's saying, don't worry, we're going to sue them, we're going to sue them, we're going to sue them. He was into it. He was suing everybody. <laughs> and, uh, but all I remember is them all yelling at us, why are you here? What, uh, why are you on the top of this mountain? Da, da, da. And it's like, it's a mountain range for skiers. And I thought, just like the enemy who says, don't come up here. Stay where you are. Live at the, live, live at the level of life that you have right now. Don't go any further. Stay right there. Don't believe for any more. Settle down. Don't get into any higher relationship with Jesus. Just stay where it's kind of, you know, lukewarmish. Stay there. Who do you think you are? I want to tell you tonight, shut the voice of the devil. <laughs> tell the devil, you be quiet. <laughs> you be quiet. I don't want to listen to you. I, in fact, I'm not listening to you. I make a decision to get after Jesus Christ. You know what? And here's how it goes with God. Step it out. Take another step. Sometimes we think, I've got to go from here all the way to there. No, you don't. Just take one more step. Jesus says, take one more step. And I'm like, Lord. <laughs> and he goes, take one more step. Take another step up the mountain with me. And here's what happens in case you know, I do this. Okay, oops. <laughs> back here. And Jesus doesn't say to me, oh, you failed. Went back. He goes, go again. Go again. Somebody nice to hear that tonight. Go again. You haven't failed. Just go again. Take another step. Next week, next month, next year, take another step. Do you know what I discovered down the track? Suddenly I was down here and I went, ooh, how did I get here? How did we get here in life? How did this happen? Do you know how? Just took another step. Jesus, I want to come up where you are. I want to come up to your level of life for me and Sue. Lord, I want to have a different life, the life you've planned for us. Jesus, I want to know you more. <laughs> Take another step. Hang on, fail. Make a mistake. Back here. Jesus says, okay, shake that off. Go again. The God we serve is the God of go again. And he's the God who says, I don't leave you alone. I'll take your hand. I want to encourage you tonight. God says, come on, let me take your hand. Tonight, if you've gone, some people ran too far, too soon, too quick. I had a friend, he came up the mountain. He said, oh, I've skied, I've skied. So I said, oh, okay, that's great. So we were in Japan for a weekend, took him up the mountain in Japan. And, uh, and he was said, oh, I've skied, but he wasn't, he said, oh, I'm a beginner intermediate, which is a start to the middle. So I said, okay, just go around here, mate. Just go around the circle here. And we gone up there. It was really, really foggy. And then when the fog lifted, we were up this really high mountain in Japan. And I was, kept looking over at him and he looked a bit unwell. And I thought, are you okay? So I skied over to him. I said, are you okay? He said, I'm traumatized. I went, you're what? He said, I'm traumatized. I went, why? He said, I didn't know it was so high up here. I can see everything. He goes, I can't move. I said, you can't move. I said, right. Uh, called my other friend. Hello. <laughs> Let's come right now. We're going to help him. We're going to help him down the mountain. And I saw right then too, in the kingdom, some people reach for things too soon. Sometimes we want to go from, uh, this is the other people. Some of us don't want to start the journey. Some want to go from here. You want to go here. 
and we get up there too soon and suddenly we've got altitude sickness. We didn't prepare. We didn't prepare for the journey. We set out with excitement. Oh, I can ski. We faked it till we made it. We said we could. I can do this. I can do that. And really, we weren't preparing the steps, taking the steps in Jesus. Discipleship steps. You got to take discipleship steps. In God, we need to realize we've got to grow in our relationship with Jesus. The church is, it's so fun. It's so alive. It's so awesome. I love your church. If I was here in this city, I said already, I'd come here. But in the middle of it all, I got to keep building with Jesus. I got to keep building my relationship with him. If you want to, you cannot go from there to there overnight. You've got to build it step by step in Jesus' name. Here's what I've discovered as I get ready to finish. You know, as you begin to move higher, here's what I found. The air is thinner at the top. The air is thinner at the top. What does that mean? It means there's less people there. There's less people. Every time I go to the top of the mountain somewhere in the world, I go, wow, there's not many people here. Less people at the top. The air's thinner. It took more cost. There's a little bit more, you know, a bit more involved in it. Maybe they had to follow a ski instructor a bit longer. Whatever it was. But there's less people there. You know what? When I'm there, I go, thank you, God, <laughs> for this mountain. But thank you, God, that I followed the instructor. Thank you, God, I kept stepping it out. Because now when I'm here... The view, the vista, the experience is so unbelievably amazing. This is incredible, God. Your creation is incredible. And thank you, God, I get to be on this pinnacle looking at what I'm looking at. Listen, it's the same in the Christian life. There's less there because <laughs> you've got to keep climbing, got to keep growing, got to keep going with Jesus. But the view is incredible. The satisfaction is amazing. The depth of relationship with Jesus is beyond words. And what you will find there and who you will find there is so, so incredible. Some of the people I found at the top of the mountain, I'm like, wow, the conversations, the connections are incredible. This is what God has got planned for your life. If you've had friends who didn't finish the journey, can I encourage you? Finish the journey. If you've lost your job and you're saying, you know what, I lost my job, can I encourage you, don't sit down, get after Jesus, start to chase him, let God give you strategies, as I said this morning, God doesn't want to give you sympathy, he wants to give you strategy, and God wants to take you into a whole new level of living in Jesus' name. If your best friend falls away, I want to encourage you tonight, don't you fall away. Build with Jesus. Begin to walk with Jesus. Begin to come up a little higher, even tonight, this week, this month. And I want to say to you, finish what God has started in your life. God's got a course for you. There's a, run, a race for you to run. And God says, finish it. Finish it. Finish it. Musicians and singers, you're here. You can play away. Finish it in Jesus' name. Don't just start it out, but finish it. You know what? I see our church flourishing. I see our church impacting nations, just like this church. But it's going to happen because there's a whole bunch of people who say, Lord, we're coming up higher. <laughs> Jesus, we want to be where you are. We want to walk in your purpose. We want to walk in your plan. We want to walk with you, Lord. Come on, we want to walk with you, Jesus. We want to walk with you, God. It's so worth it. It's so worth it. I can't wait to have grandchildren. And one day get to the end of my life and have all these grandchildren. I'm a real old dude. And they're like, man, oh man, that old guy's good. We like him. Because he kept going. Kept climbing. Kept taking another step. Do you know what? Your decisions are not just impacting your life. They're impacting those who are following you. People are watching you. People are watching you. People are watching you. I watch my son, just as I finish here, I watch my son, my second son at his wedding. My mom was 79, 80 years of age, and she flew over from Sydney to Perth for their wedding. And she got saved in the middle of my dad's worst alcoholism, so violent, so terrible. My mom got saved, and she committed herself to church and would go every week, and she'd pray over me and tell me, you're getting saved, God's going to save you. And she began to say over me, God's not just saving you, He's going to use you. He's going to use you. She'd say it all the time. He's going to use you. Then she had a prayer group in my bedroom. Oh, my gosh. 
praying over my bed, my pillow, my blankets, praying over everything. And she would not relent on me. She said, you're getting saved and you're going to, God's going to use you. And then she got committed to a church. In her 70s, she's ran the new Christian group. Late 70s, she ran a recovery group for alcoholics after being married to one. Amazing. And here she was now, 80, getting saved in her 40s. And my son goes, Nan, this speech is now for you. And began to speak to my mom about how she climbed. She walked with God. Followed Jesus out of poverty, out of alcoholism, out of depression, out of everything. And he said, Nan, because of you, now we are climbing. We are climbing. We're going higher. We're stepping into whole levels of life that dad never dreamed of. And he goes, Nan, you were the start of it. I want to encourage you tonight. You're the start of something. In your own life, your family's life, your marriage, your children, your school your university in Manchester. You're the start of it. Come up higher. Come on, time to come up higher. Come on, time to come up higher. Come on, someone needs to come up higher. Wow. Let's just pray together. Let's just pray together. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your presence. I thank you for every person here. Lord, I just thank you, God, right now. Father, for your touch, and I pray, let today, let tonight be a defining moment as people make that decision, Jesus, to get to know you, to follow you, and to come up higher. Lord, I thank you for miracles. I, I thank you literally now, Lord, somebody's entire life is going to change as they make a decision to follow you their whole life. Thank you, Lord, right now that there's a Christian here, their whole future and destiny is going to change because tonight they're making a decision. They're going to come up higher. They're coming onto the mountain. They're going to meet with you, Jesus. Perspective is changing. Their life is changing. Their future is changing. Jesus, I just thank you for that now. I thank you for an awesome new day for every person, every life. Let destinies, let futures change for good, God. Let there be miracles. Let there be breakthroughs. Let there be favor. Let there be healing. Let there be new hope, God. Thank you, Lord, for miracle generations. We give you all the praise and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.